Boston's Freedom Trail is a wonderful stroll to revolutionary history. Thousands of visitors do it every year, and in this episode, we'll do it too. In Trübit of the North End, we'll make a clam chowder, stuffed clams, tripe, and a very unique way, Dijonese, or called a la mode, and a cauliflower and potato casserole. A revolutionary feast and a taste of history. some beautiful clams right in front of me and we're gonna start by taking the clam out of its shell and if you buy clams in a shell which actually you don't have to because every seafood market you can buy chopped clams already uh, you want to make sure the clam is completely tight closed what happens is that the clam protects itself so when it gets out of the environment what it will do it will make itself really really tight now, there's a million recipes for clams that are stuffed. The one I show you today is one of my favorite. It's easy to make, it's a great dish if you entertain your friends next time. You have a nice dachi like mine, garlic, onion, peppers we already pre up. And now we're gonna put this back on the fire for a little bit to make sure the vegetables get nice and sauteed. Make sure that all the liquid comes out of the vegetable. So it's nicely, look at that, perfectly spread down. Now I'm gonna put the bacon into it. And the reason for that is I want the flavor of the bacon to be in there. This is what makes it so unique. Then I'm adding in the clams. Now I'm gonna bake on the fire. Let it simmer for a little bit more. Remember, when you cook that, you're pre-cooking it because in the end, it bakes some more in the oven. So when you use breadcrumbs like the one I'm using today, which is a salilan, which is a part of a brioche, you wanna make sure you double check uh, your seasoning. What I'm recommending is not to use any store-bought breadcrumbs for that recipe. Because store-bought breadcrumbs have a tendency to be old and not really up to the par. So I'm adding some parsley in here. And now I have to make sure I taste it, just to make sure it has enough uh, salt, enough pepper in there. And believe it or not, this mixture is done now. What's nice about it, you can make this ahead of time, anytime. If you get ready to entertain your guests, you can just use the mixer. The mixer does not have to be hot. Just heat it up like that. And then all I want to do is put a sliver of bacon on top for extra flavor and stick it in the oven. All right, now the clams are in the beehive in the commercial stove. It'll take you about five to eight minutes, maybe 375. You want the bacon to be really crisp on top so the additional flavor of the bacon penetrates the clam. That's what makes it great. Follow me on Boston's Freedom Trail. 16 stops, wow. Walter, we are here on the Freedom Trail, and this is the spot where the oldest public school in America stood, 1635, the Boston Latin School. And behind us is one of Latin School's most famous alums, Benjamin Franklin. And it was while he was here in Boston, Walter, that he apprenticed under his brother James in a newspaper business. He learned publishing here in this town. He is the only American to have signed the four most important documents in our history. The Declaration of Independence, the Treaty with France, the Treaty with Great Britain ending the Revolution, and then he signed the Constitution of the United States. Are you ready now to I'm begin our ready. journey? Yes, I'm ready. Behind us is the old State House, as we call it. That's where the royal governor sat. And right in front of that building is the place where the Boston Massacre took place. It was the winter. 1770, Walter, the 5th of March. And in front of the old state house was a lone British soldier standing sentry duty. A group of Bostonians began to torment him. He called for reinforcements for the captain of the guard. They told him, disperse, go home. They didn't. It was winter, it was icy. One of the soldiers fell. And as he fell, his musket went off. The other soldiers thought they were being fired upon and opened fire. When the smoke cleared, five Bostonians were dead. This was the Boston Massacre. In the aftermath of that, the soldiers were put on trial, and their defense counsel was none other than the great patriot John Adams. Facts are stubborn things, and whatever may be our wishes, they cannot alter the state of facts or evidence. 
Adams had such a deep belief in justice that he was determined that these soldiers must get a fair trial. Remember, an 18th century beehive wax. I hear a bacon sizzling, so they should be ready. Let's check them out. Isn't that gorgeous? Today I'm lucky I get to use an 18th century authentic dish. All right, we put a little garnish on there. The parsley on top. And the first course in tribute to New England is my unbelievable baked clams. You're going to make them someday. All your friends be your friends forever. Clam chowder is as popular as apple pie. However, there are two different clam chowders. One is in Manhattan and one is in New England. The Manhattan clam chowder is a tomato base and the New England clam chowder is a cream base. Today, in honor of our tribute to New England, we make a New England clam chowder. In the true tradition of the 18th century and Boston, mine starts off with bacon. Like a good apple smoked bacon or any kind of good bacon you have and I just cut it, whether in a chillion like that or in a dice. Now, if you can find a slab bacon like that, any regular laid out bacon will work. It's not a problem. Bacon just loves to be part of a clam chowder. So I got a touchy hot, put a metal landing blade. Now I got butter. What's unique about butter and bacon just makes it so unbelievable. And that's the flavor you get later from that uh, chowder. And I'll tell you one thing, once you eat my chowder, you're not gonna go back to anybody else's. This recipe, which is my recipe, won many times first prize in Boston for the New England Clam Chowder Contest. All right, I'm going to bake on the fire. A little heat on it. Here we go. You want to make sure you cook the bacon, but not to a crisp. You just want to get the flavor out of the bacon to get it with the onion. So don't overcook it when you do that. I got onions that are already cut, coarse cut. For my recipe, I use uh, celery stock. Now, there's a lot of recipes, including mine in my book, that uses peppers. However, I prefer the one I'm making today, which is truly New England, does not use any peppers. That's actually easy to relate to it. All right, now it goes back on the fire for a little bit. Vegetables are 85% water, so we're gonna sweat them down. So now I'm gonna put my chopped clams in here. And then, Potato, now it's a really, it's a really tricky thing. I use red bliss in my soup. Many recipes say it's just cut them raw and add it into the, to the soup. But what I do, I recommend people do a quick poach just before you put it in. Now next goes in there, it's freshly pulled thyme. Next goes in there is a good amount of cracked pepper. Salt, and I'm gonna come back later to check it again, make sure I don't over salt it. White wine. And then heavy cream. I love cream. Heavy cream. More cream. That's what makes it so good. Mm. Take this on the fire. And maybe 15 minutes into it, if not more than that, it's done. But I got to do one taste test later. The next step is a very important step if you want your chowder to turn out right. Because when I cook 18th century style, I cannot have a roux like you can make at home in a modern stove. So I have to use beurre marnier, which means equal parts butter and flour. And I love butter. I bring the whole pot over, all 40 pounds. And what I'll do is I have the beurre marnier and I put it in a bowl. For this particular recipe, if I would put it in the pot, which I normally do, I would have to go in there with a whisk and steer it. Guess what it would do? It would break the potatoes and the clams. So I'm doing this a little differently. I'm gonna put cream in here. And I'm gonna whisk that to a smooth paste. If you like to control your calorie intake and not lose too much flavor, now is a good time to omit the cream and the beurre and just use cornstarch. You make a cornstarch slurry and tie it in there. It gives you almost the same effect, but you know what? Nothing beats butter. And then you want to fold it under your soup. If you would do it differently, you would get lumps into your soup, which is not something you want to do. Put it back on the fire. Oh, what a great invention, Birmania. Look at it, how nicely it's tied up together. All right, this clam chowder looks like it is done. Look at it. Look how beautiful. The onion. Flavor of the chive makes it really spectacular. 
my clam chowder is a tribute to New England. I can taste the butter and the cream, but do you know how tough it was to make butter in the 18th century? We did it right here at Charles Thompson Estate, and it was a lot of work. If you're wondering what I'm doing here, I'm making butter the old-fashioned way. Actually, this particular butter churnip was on the actual inventory list right here that the Charles Thompson used. Right, boss? That's right. That was the way to preserve dairy products was to convert the cream into butter. It's the first time I'm using this particular device. I'm used to using the uh, toast Oh, well, there are lots of different ones. Yep. This is a butter churn, and it's basically a tub, and inside is the dasher or agitator, and the dasher goes up and down, and you agitate the cream. It becomes whipped cream and eventually turns into butter. This is known as a daisy. These are very popular even today, and you just sit here and crank, crank, crank. In fact, the children here at Harrington House make uh, butter during our summer picnics. It's still liquid, but it's getting, yeah, no. it's, it's getting stiff. Oh, you can see it right there. Yeah, you can see it soon, soon we got. This is why they made supermarkets. <laughs> Booz, that's taken a long time. Let's go see your garden. You know, there's nothing more impressive to me as a chef than a garden right next to the kitchen. And everybody would have a little bit of a garden to produce something that they could use in their own kitchens and store for the winter. And they gardened right into the fall. They garden 10 months a year here. <laughs> Eggplants and zucchinis, they would have gone down already. Oh, absolutely. Because they were all over on cartoon. And... Hey, Walter, we have some nice looking eggplants here, too. I'll pull some off for you. Here we go. Yeah. They make us a little eggplant doré for supper. At your service, sir. Oh, look at that, boys. Almost there, huh? Almost yeah. there, yeah. In the 18th century, what they would do on the upscale estates, they would go to the pane and really do butter molds. And all you really did do is you take the butter and you spread it in the butter mold and later just serve it up so it's gorgeous on the table. Then flavoring would be another thing. You could make a pecan butter. I have ginger. This is makes a beautiful ginger butter or a little bit of uh, cinnamon butter. Just put a little bit, very little. Mix it under. So obviously churning butter, different flavor butters, which is an important part of uh, 18th century life. You heard me say this many times because every chef has many favorite recipes. However, this one has got to be on the top of my list. And it's called tripe a la mode. And what it is, it's different from the, the Italians make tripe and many other countries make tripe. This is done with the Dijon mustard cream. It's very, very delicious. So here I have two versions of tripe. One is the honeycomb. Now, tripe, for people who don't know it, is the stomach of the cow. And this is the intestines of the cow, a livro. Never worry about it because tripe cannot be sold raw in this country. It's illegal. So when you get tripe, it's already pre-cooked all the time. This one over here, I'm just cutting it in big chunks like so. This is the one with a lot, a lot of little leaves. It's so gorgeous and tastes so beautiful to eat. And cut it into a small, like a dice, like that. The honeycomb I cut into a chillion. I fully admit it's an acquired taste and not for everybody's palate. Remember, it may look a little awkward, but the flavor is absolutely spectacular. You know, it's not very often I have a chance to use actual copperware from the 18th century. This happens to be a Moviel Rondeau, we call it, which I make this dish in. It makes it so much more exciting to cook this tripe. You see me cooking usually in the hot iron pots or the dutchies, this particular recipe is too delicate to cook in a dutchie. So what you're gonna use for that is you do is a stand, as you see me doing it, you put the coal underneath, let the pot get hot, and we're gonna make this fantastic dish. I'm gonna put into the pot some butter. And while the butter is melting, I got a couple of few more onions quick. It's very important that the onion gets cut lengthwise for that. I got garlic in my rondo. I just want to sweat it down, then put the onions into it. Need a little blanch on the onion, kind of just so it wilts a little bit. The shallot gives us some sweetness to it. Shallots. Now I'm in the tripe. Now I'm going to add some white wine into it. Any stock would work. Chicken stock is perfect for that. All right. 
when you cook recipes like that and many other cream sauces and different sauces, you want a low fire because you don't want it to get tough. The same pot from France, from Oviel, that Thomas Jefferson, George Washington, Monroe and others used, I get to use today. And using the same method of cooking, what we call a slow fire. Look at that. Absolutely, to me, this is like heaven. Heaven on earth. So now what I'm adding into it is the, the binder, which is the Burmanier. Again, reverse cooking technique. Okay, now it's gonna go on the fire for two minutes. So now that the Burmanier took hold, you see the beautiful velvety complexity of the sauce. Now I'm gonna bring it back to my landing, to my table, add in the cream, add in the mustard, a little bit of brown sauce, and we're ready to eat this one-of-a-kind dish. My pièce de résistance is ready to receive the final blessing. The final blessing is Dijon mustard, and you want to get the best mustard that money can buy for this dish. You fold the mustard under it. Also notice how you see the onions. I want the onions to be still visible. So I just saute them down so they don't really break apart. A little bit with the Dijon mustard. If there was heaven, tribe would be in it. So you see that? You see how beautiful and velvety it all comes together? Now I got some chives already chopped and parsley. Now I'm gonna just mix it up a little bit and now I'm gonna give it a taste, making sure that it has enough salt. Perfect, all it needs now is my brown sauce. I use demi-glace, but you can use any brown sauce because there's so much flavor in the dish itself so you don't need to worry about it. And then it's gonna get a little green. Bit of green and We are ready to dish up this pièce de résistance. Let me try my tribe à la mode. Oh, spectacular. And let's continue our journey along Boston's Freedom Trail. I recognize this guy behind us there, Doctor. He makes some fantastic brews, you know. You're right, Walter, that's Samuel Adams. He was Boston's most famous revolutionary. He was a high son of liberty. Of course, the royal governor thought he was a high son of something else, you know. <laughs> right behind Samuel Adams is Faneuil Hall. The original building was built in 1742. And it's in this building, during the era of the American Revolution, that a lot of those agitated town meetings took place. And so it's known here in this town as the Cradle of Liberty. Look at me. I'm walking the Freedom Trail. And what better place to be on this trail than the building right behind me, Walter? That's Paul Revere's house, 15 North Square. It was the knock-knock on that door over there, Walter. On the evening of April 18, 1775, that awakened Paul Revere. And the message was, you're riding tonight, Mr. Revere. So, Doctor, this is a very, very impressive ship. Can you tell me a little more about it? This is USS Constitution, and she's the oldest commissioned warship afloat in the world. She fought against the British in the War of 1812. She engaged with the British frigate Guerriere in one of those rollicking sea battles of the 18th and 19th century. And it was during that battle an American sailor looked over the side of Constitution and he saw the British cannonballs bouncing off her sides. And the sailor yelled out, Huzzah, her sides are made of iron. And that's how she got her nickname, Old Iron Sides. Bunkers Hill, June 17th. The British crossed over from Boston and landed here in Charlestown to drive the Americans off this hill. By two o'clock in the afternoon, they were ready for their assault. And as they were coming up this hill, the American commander, Colonel William Prescott, told his men, don't fire, men, don't fire, don't fire until you see the whites of their eyes. As the British drew nearer, the Americans fired. And the British went down in windrows and retreated rapidly down the hill. On the third assault, the British took the hill and inflicted heavy casualties on the Americans. Although it was an American defeat, American militia had here at Bunker's Hill shown that they could stand against the regulars. 
Walter, thank you for coming to Boston. We've seen lots of wonderful sights along the Freedom Trail, many more to see, and I hope you come back again soon. You bet. Thank you. <laughs> Boy, Boston is a beautiful city, but a lot of tokens, so I need some nourishment. Actually, the dish I'm making next is a cauliflower and potato casserole. What's unique about it is the simplest dish you ever want to make, and it's so easy. All you need to do, take any kind of potato, chop it up however you want to do it, boil it so it's done. Then you take some cauliflower, and the cauliflower, you just want to cut it in like very easy chunks. Now, if you're in a hurry and you want to make it faster, all you got to do is cut the cauliflower in smaller pieces. The smaller the piece, the less cooking time it needs. So all you want to do like so, take the cauliflower in the, in the bowl. I have some water behind me, salted water, throw it right in there. Absolutely, almost no time. All right, the potatoes are done for this casserole. The cauliflower, you don't want to overcook it because you want to make sure in the end that you can really Get a nice crunch to it once it's cooked. A little bit of salt in here, nutmeg. So now you can do two different ways. You can use Gruyere or Swiss cheese, or you can use cheddar. I actually like the yellow cheddar a lot. So all you want to do is just have any kind of uh, grinder and just basically just do like so and go right into the potato. Now you want to mix it all up. You don't have to be too gentle on that. And all you want to put on top is breadcrumbs over it. Plenty of breadcrumbs. Paprika. This is Hungarian paprika. Go over it like so. This is a very delicious casserole. There are many, many casseroles that we served in England. You can do it with, uh, with uh, rutabaga, you can do it with turnips, carrots, anything goes. Basically what it is, is smashed potato flavored with a vegetable. Cauliflower would have been a natural dish to be served. So now I'm putting this in my beehive in this beautiful Moviel pot. Stick it right in here. And like I said, leave it in there for about 35, 35 to 40 minutes. Remember, if you like your vegetable more cooked, you cook the cauliflower longer. I like it so you still get a feeling of the cauliflower and the potatoes. The cheese melts it together good, the paprika. It's a beautiful dish. How gorgeous. How gorgeous, look at that. So all we're gonna do is we're gonna spoon it. Look at how nice the cheese got melted. We're gonna spoon it into my side dish here. See how beautiful it all melted together. You can just smell the, the cauliflower and the potatoes. It's so just absolutely fantastic. This would be the ideal accompaniment together with my tripe. A little bit of parsley on top. I hope you enjoyed our tour of historic Boston and the food we've prepared for a taste of history.